April 21st, 1930, inmates of the Ohio State Penitentiary had just been locked into their cells for the evening when cries of fire began echoing through the prison's six-story cell house. The fire was spreading quickly and, as smoke billowed through the wing, panic ensued for the trapped prisoners. To their horror, the prison guards refused to release them from their cages where they had watched a scene unfold which would become the worst prison disaster in U.S. history. Opened in 1834, the Ohio State Penitentiary in Columbus, Ohio had been in service for nearly 100 years at the time of the fire. In that time, it became known as a truly nightmarish place. It developed a reputation as being primitive and brutal. Reportedly, the treatment of inmates by guards and other prisoners alike was often inhumane. This was summed up in 1893 by the prison superintendent who stated, 10,000 pages of history of the Ohio Penitentiary would not give one idea of the inward wretchedness of its 1900 inmates. The unwritten history is known only by God himself. The prison, which had been built to house 1,500 people, was often obscenely overcrowded. By 1930, the facility was at nearly three times its intended capacity, with a stunning 4,300 prisoners housed within its walls. Because of the cruel reputation of the prison and other terrible events that befell it, it was frequently regarded as being cursed or damned. One such example, possibly exacerbated by overcrowding, was a deadly cholera epidemic which swept through the institution in 1849, killing 121 inmates. But it was that Easter Monday in April 1930 that became its most noteworthy catastrophe. After the prisoners in cell blocks G and H were locked into their cells for the night following dinner, a fire broke out in the wing. In the days leading up to the fire, part of the building was under construction, working on adding additional cell blocks I and K, which bordered the G and H cell blocks at the northern end of the cell building to alleviate the burden of overcrowding. It was believed that the fire started on the construction scaffolding in this area, or in the roof adjacent to this area. In any case, the fire quickly consumed the wooden scaffolding and construction materials and spread through the roof of the cell house. The cries of fire coming from the inmates initially went unheeded. The response from the guards seemed to stem from confusion and disorganization. Whether untrusting or callous, many guards were hesitant to release the inmates without a direct order. Even with the threat of death immediately looming, keeping the prisoners captive remained the highest priority. As the smoke filled the cell block, screams for help became more frenzied. The situation grew more serious by the second. At around 5.45 p.m., two night guards, William Baldwin and Thomas Little, were waiting to start their shifts at 6 p.m when a prisoner ran into the guard room and yelled fire. Realizing the state of emergency, the guards rushed into action. They encountered day guard Watkins blocking access to the cage gate for the upper tiers. Even at this point, the wing was filling with smoke and fire could be seen in the upper reaches of cell blocks I and K. Regardless of the pleading from Little and Baldwin, Watkins refused to open the cell gate to the upper tiers, despite the fact that those in this section were in the most immediate danger. Watkins simply refuted, I got no orders to unlock those men. At first, the night guards did what they could to assist. They freed inmates from some of the cells in the lower tiers that were in relatively little danger just to do something productive. They were the first guards to release any inmates at all. However, feeling the increasing pressure of the situation, 
they made their way back to Watkins to further implore him to act. Little is quoted as saying, get this goddamn door open or those fellows are going to die. Watkins finally agreed to open the gate. He approached Little with the key, who hurriedly snatched it from his hand to open the gate. Due to Watkins' inaction, about seven to nine minutes had already passed since he was first asked to open the gate. In that time, dozens of inmates had already perished in the rapidly spreading fire. Desperate prisoners, helpless in their situation, splashed each other with water in a futile effort to protect themselves. The heat intensified in the cells of the upper tiers as the fire drew closer. One survivor recalls, I hope I never go to hell if it's this hot. Little and Baldwin hurried toward the upper tiers. They unlocked all the cells that they could, but could not make it past the fourth tier due to the intensity of the flames and smoke. It's commonly reported that a small group of freed inmates overpowered one of the guards who was refusing to help, took his cell key, and ran back through the smoke-filled halls to free their fellow inmates. However, the reality of the situation is that Little and Baldwin handed out keys to inmates who were participating in the rescue efforts. In any case, it was too late. That seven to nine minutes wasted likely ensured the deaths of hundreds of prisoners who may have otherwise been safely evacuated. One of the prisoners who took part in the rescue later recalled, Naturally, all of those men were in there and hollering and screaming for help, and some of the men was praying, and some of them was cussing, and some of them were raving. It was a question to do what you could do to help them. Awaiting the prisoners upon escape into the prison yard was a local battalion of hundreds of National Guardsmen and Army soldiers armed with machine guns and rifles to prevent any potential escape plots. Not a single soldier helped in freeing any trapped inmates. It was also reported that Due to the indifference displayed by many of the guards to the lives of the inmates, a riot ensued. Supposedly, the prisoners even fought against the firefighters when they arrived on scene, disallowing them from accessing the fire and, instead, pelted them with rocks and cut their hose lines. When the fire was finally controlled, the extent of the disaster was there to be uncovered. That evening, in the G and H blocks, there were a total of 800 prisoners. In all, 320 of them died in the disaster. The primary causes of death were smoke inhalation and suffocation, with several having been burned to death. An additional 130 suffered serious injuries while many of the victims were imprisoned for serious crimes, a significant portion of these individuals were there for crimes including pickpocketing, manufacturing liquor, possessing liquor, fraudulent checks, and forgery, infractions hardly deserving of the penalty they ultimately received. In a controversial move by Ohio Governor Myers Cooper, he ordered an investigation be completed by Attorney General Gilbert Bettman. Bettman put together a board of inquiry to examine the facts surrounding the penitentiary fire. Among those facts, they found several disturbing epiphanies regarding the prison's lack of leadership and organization. The investigation discovered that the prison had no plans or procedures to follow in the event of an emergency. They also had no fire safety equipment in the facility. During the fire, Warden Preston Thomas gave only vague commands for guards to get down there with no other instructions before evacuating himself to the prison yard. This lack of leadership caused confusion which led to the refusal of Watkins to unlock the gate which drastically increased the death toll of the disaster. Further, 
Some prisoners testified that smoke could be smelled within the cell house as early as 5 p.m. and there was clear evidence that it was seen billowing from outside no later than 5.20 p.m. The warden himself testified that he knew about the fire by 5.35. However, the first alarm didn't reach the Columbus Fire Department until 5.39, and even then, that alarm came from a source outside of the prison. The penitentiary didn't report the fire until 5.40 and provided no accounting for what actions were taken between the times of 5.20 and 5.40 p.m. If the primary concern was that the prisoners would escape after being released from their cells, that notion was also dispelled in the report. The prisoners would not have been simply released into the streets. They would have found themselves in the cell house locked behind barred doors and windows. Even escaping there, they would have had to contend with 30-foot walls manned by armed guards that surrounded the building. Leaving their cells by no means meant being freed from prison. According to the Board of Inquiry's report, there were a number of potential causes investigated for the fire over the days following this disaster. The causes included potential arson, spontaneous combustion, or faulty wiring. In fact, they pointed out in the report that there was strong circumstantial evidence that it was caused by defective wiring of the work lights used in the construction area. They noted that it was the probable cause of the fire. However, things took a turn shortly after when State Fire Marshal Ray Gill stated his certainty that the fire's origin was incendiary and was started in an area of the new I and K cell blocks where some inmates had been working. Though, due to the area in question being completely destroyed, Gill's opinion amounted to little more than conjecture. That is, until a few months later on August 19th, when James Raymond, also known as Paul Sullivan, confessed that he and two others named Hugh Gibbons and Clinton Great set the fire in an attempt to create a distraction and escape. Fearful of retaliation for snitching on the other inmates, James Raymond asked to be put into solitary confinement. Two days later, before being able to formally testify, James Raymond committed suicide by hanging himself in his cell with strips of cloth torn from his mattress. Following this confession, Gibbons and Great were also put into solitary confinement. Initially, they denied having any involvement in the fire. But by May of the following year, enough evidence had been collected against them to convict them of murder. They were both sentenced to life in prison for setting the fire, using candles from the prison's church and oily rags. Less than two years later, in January of 1933, Clinton Great also hung himself in his cell. This disaster served as a catalyst for resolving the issue of overcrowding in the Ohio Penitentiary. To start, the state of Ohio repealed laws requiring minimum sentences, which was partially to blame for the situation. Additionally, the Ohio Parole Board was established in 1931, and over the course of a year, they released over 2,300 of the institution's prisoners onto parole. Though no memorial currently exists to the convicts who prematurely lost their lives, memorial services were held on April 27, 1930, in the penitentiary's Catholic and Protestant chapels and Jewish synagogue. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you'd like the video and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Until next time.